Hmm. Okay, um, good morning guys. Um, I have to apologise in advance. Um, uh, this panel probably won't be as exceptional as the rest of them have been over the course of the weekend. Because after three nights of drinking, and this is the first time I've seen 12 in the last month, so um, I'm probably not in the best state to do this, but I'm going to give it a go anyway. So, um, welcome to the You Can Make Video Games panel, or to put it another way, You Can Make Video Games. <laughs> well, maybe, hopefully. Um, I'm going to have a go at um, convincing you can anyway. Um, so, if you are wondering why you came to this panel, um, I don't know why I am. Uh, the, this isn't about going into the games industry itself, there's going to be a panel after this um, that will cover that topic if you'd really like to hear lots of woeful, depressing stories from very cynical people who work in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure Sonny here will tell you it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, speaking of cynical people who work in the games industry. <laughs> Um, so yes, also I'm not gonna, this isn't really going to go how you can make money out of um, video games because that's a whole other topic um, with lots of complications and if you want to get famous out of it, really, really good luck. And if you wanted to watch um, you know, cosplay skits, you are definitely in the wrong room. Um, but thankfully, I, I thought I was going to be running up against the Amaki, but I get the impression that it'll probably run late, so um, yeah, I, probably, I probably might get a few cosplays in here, hopefully. Um, so yes, what this panel is about is about making video games. Um, Strange enough. And um, so what the structure's going to be is I've got two hours, but I'm not actually going to use that because I think I'm going to bore the hell out of you if I talk for two hours. So what I'm going to try to do, <laughs> I'm boring the hell out of you now, obviously. But um, no, I'm going to um, try and talk for about half hour about um, a bunch of things like um, preconceptions and pitfalls and things you can do wrong and things that might stop you from making games and how you can and I think you can do it. And then I'm going to do, uh, put my money where my mouth is by doing like a half hour demonstration of me making a game really quickly. Uh, so, because I'm going to make it half hour, it's probably not going to be the next Metal Gear, but um, hopefully it'll give you some idea that you can actually do games quite quickly and the tools do make that easy. Uh, so what else am I going to say? Um, if, yeah, I'm not really the teacher type normally, I do presentations here and I'm usually the drunk shouter type. I was the guy at university who was texting or falling asleep. So um, I don't want to speak too. <laughs> no, I don't want to speak too formal. So basically, if you've got questions or anything, just shout them out to me. I'm happy to have a discussion about any of the topics or anything I talk about. Um, you know, if you feel that shouting out is a bit rude, if you've got very polite parents or like mine, um, then um, feel free to raise your hand. And I'll, I'll take questions or whatever. Uh, what else have I got to need to mention? Oh yeah, um, probably going to be mentioning the word indie games a lot because that tends to be what um, people call it when people make games on their own um, rather than for big companies. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I mean by indie. I'm, I'm not I'm sure you'd figure it out. Um, so that's about it. So you might be wondering who I am and why I can do this top this presentation. <laughs> this rather fetching picture of me. I find I'm very photogenic. Uh, so I'm an, I am an indie game developer, I suppose technically. I um, don't work for the game. I don't work in the games industry. I don't particularly want to work in the games industry. I'm quite happy doing my own thing at the moment. But these are a sample of some of the games I've made. Maybe probably some likely you'll have heard or played any of the stuff I've done, but um, they are all available on my website for free download at the moment. Um, the, probably the biggest, most substantial one is the anime style um, sci fi horror point click adventure thingy over there. Um, but and yeah, I don't know. I'm quite happy with a bunch of these games. Feel free. I have no idea how, how badly that shows you all the lights on. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, so I'm not, I'm, my name's Richard Perrin, um, everyone calls me Perrin, so feel free to do the same, and um, if you've been to these conventions before, you might have seen a panel called Stage Clear, which is what I usually do with an um, Irish games journalist friend of mine called Rob Fahey, um, and we usually come to these things, we get very drunk and shout at each other about games, um, not doing that this time, sadly, since Rob's um, about to leave for Japan, and so can be bothered to come. And um, so instead, if you, if, you, if you are craving some gaming opinions, um, then I will tell you now that I don't rather like StarCraft 2, and after a year, I'm still somehow playing Modern Warfare 2. Um, but that's about, that's about it you're going to get at me for gaming opinions today. So what about you guys? Um, hopefully, I've got a decent mix of people here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm hoping we've got a mixture of, you know, some, some of you are hopefully just gamers with ideas who like to make games. I'm sure a bunch of you are on or have graduated from games design courses and may or may not have found a way into the industry. Uh, maybe you're in the industry working at some low-level position wishing you weren't testing some um, crappy um, slumber party game or something and instead... Um, and <laughs> these guys in the front here developed... Uh, what's it called? Sleepover party? Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> should wear shirts. Buy it online. Buy it online, yeah, because apparently it didn't make it to the stores. Anyway, so if, you, if you've got a job testing, um, testing those games and you want to make your own games, again, hopefully this will be for you. But ultimately, I think the way I see about video games is I think it's something anyone can do. Um, I don't think the barriers to entry are as high as people presume they are. And I think if you're any type of creative person, whether it be artist, musician, designer, or anything, you can probably make games. And all you need to do is understand what tools and things are available for to do that. 
So, if you are here um, and you're not just avoiding the market and you actually want to make games, um, I presume you're not doing so already, so you probably have a bunch of reasons why you think you can't make video games. Uh, these are what I think are probably the biggest key concept, misconceptions, I would say, about making games that put people off. The first, obviously, being that people think, oh, I'm not a coder, and so I can't make games because, ah, it's actually coding's a bitch, and to be fair, I can't code either, I'm fucking awful. But ultimately, the tools available these days are fantastic, and if you, if you really are just starting out and don't want to code, there are some great tools out there that will allow you to skip that part of it. Um, you need to you need some understanding of logic, which is why I say you could probably make games. I mean, if you're really thick, um, you can't. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> so if you're too stupid to understand when one thing happens, do another thing. Then, then nothing I can say can help you make games. Um, but if you have some basic understanding of, of logic, then you can probably use some of the tools available to make games. Um, so the next one is obviously games is actually quite, it's a lot of hard work. And I think this is, this, this is because most people, um, well, okay, I'm saying most people, I'm generalizing, but people on forums seem to always want to make the last game they've played, but with a few changes. They're like, oh, I just played WoW for a few hours, it'd be great if, if the loot dropped differently. So I'm gonna make WoW 2. Um, don't do that. <laughs> Don't try to bring WoW 2 or Modern Warfare 3, that's not going to work. Basically, you've got to be realistic about what you can do when you're getting started out. And I, and I know myself and lots of other people, um, when you're starting out, you probably jump in with quite an ambitious project and think this is going to be the one that's going to make a, a dent and people are going to notice you for. But the reality is the best way to start out is to make something simple, try out a few ideas. Oh, sorry, we've got a quick question. What about um, games like Little Big Planet where you can create like level design itself? Uh, what, what do you mean as, as a tool for making games? Yeah, um, well, the, the, well, Little Big Planet's an interesting one because um, I find it complicated and hard, <laughs> and I make games. Because um, Little Big Planet is amazing. Uh, um, I find the tool set required you to go through about uh, four or five hours of Stephen Fry talking you through tutorials, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> and in a lovely voice. But then and then I had to use a PlayStation Pad to try and build a level design. And to me, that actually was less intuitive than, than actually using proper game development tools. Um, but I, I, mean, I do think there's nothing. I mean, it's great to play with them if you if you don't have access or you don't want to play with the tools. You can learn a hell of a lot about level design by playing with anything like that. Um, but again, um, I'll come to it a bit later, but I do think that ultimately, if you actually want to play around with the tools available to build games yourself, you're going to get, probably do more than you could just playing with, with Little Big Planet. I love Little Big Planet. <laughs> um, so where was I? Uh, Hard work. Yeah, so yeah, um, so yeah. Um, all I said what I wanted to do, really. Ultimately, if you pick small ideas, you can make something in you know, a weekend, in a few hours. I mean, I'm going to make something in a half hour, hopefully. It doesn't all fuck up. Uh, but the idea, the idea is just pick something small and play around with ideas and get, and get going and making games. And once you've made a few games, then you can become more ambitious as you go along. Um, another one I've heard a lot, actually, um, is people say that I'm more an ideas guy. Um, sadly, I think if you're an ideas guy when it comes to games, you're nothing. Um, because uh, ideas are a dime a dozen. People, people on the outside seem to think that nobody in the game industry has any good ideas for games, that's why they're making crap games. But the reality is, everybody working on the game from the ground probably has an idea in their head for a game they'd love to make. Um, and what actually makes a game interesting is how you implement it. You can, you can, give, two, you can give ten people the same idea and the game you get from each of them would be different. Um, so being ideas now doesn't mean anything. Ultimately that just means you're not willing to put the hard work into actually make a game. Um, and again, if you're, if you're lazy, I can't help you either. Can't help you either. <laughs> Sorry? Good idea doesn't necessarily sell. Well, uh, well, okay. Well, I'm actually going to go into what sells because I mean, my games don't sell. The business of games, the business of games, the business of indie games is a big, complicated issue, and I, I could argue about it for hours, and I have done on many occasions. And if you want to argue about it later, that's fine. But um, I figured that's pretty much a topic in and of itself. <laughs> Uh, and the next one is that you'll need a team. So this is what is going to be the first little bunch of tips I've got today. So um, my parent tip number one for you today is to don't form teams. Uh, this is one I certainly think you can get out on university courses, is the idea that to make a game you need a programmer, you need an artist, you need a musician, maybe you need a designer, and maybe you need ten other people you don't really need. The reality is, um, I think if you've got a few mates you can work with, you know, if you've got friends like you, you know really well, you're an artist, or somebody, somebody you can work with that you know, that's great, but don't go on a recruitment drive. Um, don't go on the internet and start posting a forum saying, I'm looking to make this game and I need these, this list of X people, because the reality is you don't need these people. Um, you can make games for yourself, but we've all got the shortcomings. I mean, I can't draw or make music very well, but there are always getting around that, and I'll come to those later. Um, my main issue here is that if you just look around the internet, you'll find a million and one failed online projects where everyone's formed these big teams to make games together. Um, and you'll very quickly find that project management is a bitch, and instead of making games, you'll spend your time being a project manager, which sucks. So, um, again, this is, some of this is about starting out and getting, getting some games out there, and you know, over time, maybe you want to bring people on board, but Start out just making some stuff on your own and get, get, get a feel for it, make some games and form teams later. Um, 
So, okay. Uh, so what can you make? Um, well, I've already touched on this, but ultimately you've just got to work with re within realistic boundaries. Um, you've just got to think, I'm going to make a game and, and I don't want to spend the next seven years on it, so I'll make something in, you know, in a month. So if I make, it has like three or four key features and it, it does this, it's a simple idea, and, and, and then, then that's all you need to do. Um, I don't actually, I don't know why I put this slide in, I've already really covered this. Um, <laughs> So, but actually, I guess, oh, I see why, because it leads to my next one, which is to just have a tiny scope. Like, build your game with, with the idea of thinking of, of what would be the simplest way of implementing an idea and try that out. Because what you're going to do, and the more you make games, is realise that after you've made something simple, you realise actually this part of it was really easy, and I didn't think that would be. And then this part that I thought what, what I was going to do in like two, two minutes took me a week, and I just, and, you know, angry, you know, screamed at it, which uh, we've all done if we've been coding. Um, so, um, just basic small, small, but the, but the other, I'm reading my notes here, so I have no idea what I'm talking about now. Uh, okay, yeah, well, actually, oh, well, I've really skipped over. So make whatever you like, don't go crazy, don't remake the last thing, make something really simple. Yeah, yeah, okay, I've covered all this already. Wow, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, next tip is they're not all Braid. Um, <laughs> if, you've, if you've heard of, I think most of you probably heard of Braid, but it came out a couple of years ago, it was an indie game on, on Xbox Live, and um, it kind of, sorry, was something absent there? Hard. Yeah, it's really hard, yes. Um, especially if you're trying to get the hidden stars, which are a motherfucker, even with a guard. It's um, a bit of a cheat to call it an indie game, though. Sorry? It's a bit of a cheat to call it an indie game, because you had thousands and thousands of dollars behind it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not going to get into arguing what is and isn't an indie game, because that's another huge issue. I mean, like, I went to, to GDC this year at the end of this conference, and like, the IGF was full of what well, all look like most indie games, and then you had Shatter there, which obviously had a fucking huge budget. Um, and you're just thinking, it doesn't really sit next to some of these other things made by two guys in their basement. But anyway, the reason I bring Braid up, not because it's an indie game, or, but because it's almost somehow a poster child of indie games. And I think people, there's a misconception that making games on your own, simply making indie games or anything like that, is that you need to be innovative and really stand out and be something new that no one's seen before. And that's actually not what you need to do. Um, you can if you want. I mean, some people are really, they're just full of ideas that are new and interesting. But ultimately, if you just, even if you just make something that's like a really established, well-known game genre and just do your interpretation of it, your take on it is going to be different and unique to what anybody else would have done. Um, and, and I think spending your time chasing after being unique and different is probably going to be, um, it's probably just going to waste your time. Instead, just focus on what you're interested in, what you want to do, um, instead of spending your time trying to be something weird and quirky. Um, I do love the character designs of that, I really do. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's see. So, that's, I'm going to give you a quick game design 101 lesson here, which are there are no rules to game design. Um, <laughs> Anyone who says there are is probably lying or misleading, or I don't know, um, or probably a lecturer. Um, the, the thing about game design is that um, there are lots of, there's lots of books about it, and there's lots of discussion about the internet, and it's worth, getting, it's worth reading, it's worth knowing what other people have to say about it. But actually, there are no rules, there's no single rule to game design I've ever heard that I couldn't find. At least a few games that trump that rule um, by, being, by being interesting in ways that completely destroy what should be, what you know, sounds quite sensible. Uh, the best example I can give is that games don't have to be fun. Um, and that's probably the key thing people will tell you about games is that they should be fun. But um, for my mind, a game like Silent Hill, which I love, it's not actually fun. It's frustrating and scary and it's very emotional. <laughs> Um, but it's not a fun game, and, and it, it succeeds brilliantly without being fun. Um, the games don't have to be easy, they don't have to be accessible, um, they, don't, and they don't have to be any of the things that you would think would be you know, desirable um, as a game designer. Ultimately, you just have to try and find what you want to make. Um, the tricky thing is to not be influenced by what other people out there are making, or what you think is popular right now, um, or what you imagine an audience might want to possibly buy. Um, I think certainly when you're starting out a game, it's just to try, when you get your feel for it, make the kind of games you want to make. Um, and um, I, I see, again, on the indie scene, I've seen a lot of people who've made really weird and interesting stuff um, that, I can, uh, that only comes about when you're just saying, I don't really care what, what, what somebody wants to play. And um, one of my favourite, um, well, I say favourite, one of the most interesting games I played from the indie scene was a game where um, you simulate a serial killer, but where you have to drill into somebody's head and pour acid into it. Um, it's a horrible game. It's horrible, and really, really made me feel upset at playing it. And I thought it was an amazing experience because I've never, even playing loads of horror games, I never made a game where I just felt so bad, like holding down the mouse button because they're just really into someone's head. And it's like <laughs> everything about the game is wrong. Everything about the, the, the design is wrong, but it, but, it's, but it's an amazing game. And it's like I, I, you know, the guy made it in a few days, and it's just, and that's that's the kind of stuff I love to see where people are just use games as a way to express themselves. As, I guess maybe an artist you want to be pretentious about, but ultimately just express yourself and find a way of making interesting games. Um, and, and then again, just they don't have to be they don't have to be ones that are going to sell well um, on you know on Xbox Live or whatever. Uh, yeah, next tip for you is to ditch the design document. <laughs> and this is one especially aimed at people who've gone from, from games courses. 
because this is um, something that's taught, that seems to be taught as gospel, that ultimately you need a game use design document to write a game. Um, you're not working on a multi-million dollar project, you don't have a huge team that you need to coordinate. Um, and what I find with the design document, because I've done it uh, myself, and all, all that happens is you do all your creative thinking of the game up front. And what you're not doing is, and what, what, you're, what you should be doing, is as you make the game, try things out, try ideas out, get it playable as quickly as possible, and start playing around with what, 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 you, you know, what is actually interesting to you in the game. I'm trying to avoid using the word fun, because I just said fun doesn't count. But, um, ultimately, just, like, I think if you just sit and do all the design from you're imagining how the game will play in your head, rather than actually playing and finding out what actually works and what doesn't. Um, and also, like, I think, again, universities teach game design documents as a, as a, a valuable skill you're going to need to know if you're going to try and get into the games industry, but writing design documents isn't hard, there's not skill to that. I mean, oh, oh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just, you know, writing ideas down on paper. I mean, all I say, if you're making a small game, write, make notes in notepad and, and write things on paper, however it works for you, just, just keep word closed, um, you don't need it. Iterative design is the best, well, like, to me, anyway, I think the best way. I should have said at the start, actually, pretty much everything I say here is obviously my thoughts on this, but really do it whatever you, you want, because the best rule is just, um, if, if somebody's telling you advice that you, um, you don't really agree with, um, just don't listen to it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I could be right, you could be wrong, but you know, find out for yourself, don't, don't, don't rely on me, don't rely on anybody, don't rely, don't rely on just like, um, certainly don't rely on lecturers who've never worked in the industry, I'm really down on games courses today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm sure I'm going to be on this. So anyway. Uh, let's talk tools. Um, obviously I said that making games is easy um, and all you need to do is the right tools to do that. So I'm going to try and talk you through a bunch of them. Everything I'm going to show is going to be free um, because there are an amazing set of free tools out there now and you don't really need to spend money to get, to get a leg up. And that's a mistake I've made over the years of thinking, if I buy this or I buy this book or whatever, I'll learn something that I wouldn't have had. But actually, pretty much if you've got the dedication and the time, you can do most of it for free anyway. So let me talk you through a bunch of tools. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to group them into two groups then, beginner tools and intermediate tools. The beginner tools are for people who really are just starting out, you've got no coding background and you just want to, you just want to try and make something um, and you don't really want to get bogged down in the technicalities of, of hundreds of thousands of lines of code or whatever. So, Game Maker is the first one. Um, this one probably is a bit of a stigma attached to it, I mean, I think partly because of the name, partly because there's a community of idiotic 12 year olds in America making, churning out hundreds and hundreds of, like, thousands of Really shit games. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I can't, I can't fault them because ultimately these people, they're, they're making stuff. I mean, it's not, it's not great stuff, it's not stuff I want to play, but I mean, hopefully that, that, that will be an experience that they'll build on and make great games. But I throw an example here. This is a game called Spelunky by Derek Yu, which is actually an incredible game and it's made in game maker. Um, and I've seen, I've seen thousands of great games made in like hundreds, that's hard, um, But Spelunky is a great one that's just like, um, uh, I don't know if anyone needs to spend time to explain explaining it, but it's like this procedural generated. Um, Dungeon Crawler game, it's very, very cool. But I, I mean, I use Game Maker when I do game jams. I'll talk about game jams later, but I, I use it as a tool for quick prototyping and making simple games. I can make a game, I mean, we, we do these game jams and I make games in Game Maker in two or three hours, um, which if I open up coding libraries, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get anywhere at all. Um, some people do, uh, but I, I use a quick tool like this. Um, and I think Game Maker's fantastic. And especially if you don't want to code, Game Maker's one of the best ones because while it does have a full coding engine in there if you need it, you can just use these drag and drop things and say, if someone presses left on the keyboard, to left. It's just this very, very simple workflow. You create sprites in it, it has a little 2D to, um, um, you know, drawing tool in it, and you turn those into objects and drop them in the room. It's a really simple tool, and um, one of the best, and one of the simplest and best. And um, if you ignore the kind of stigma attached that only produces really weird and um, you know, sort of cheap knockoff games, you can actually pretty much make anything you can think of in Game Maker, as long as it's 2D, obviously. It actually does 3D as well, but not very well. Um, so I also want to mention Construct, uh, which is very similar to Game Maker. It's a bit more modern tool. Um, it's very difficult to distinguish which one I would recommend over the other because Construct is more modern tool, developed more recently, and it has kind of like um, uh, has kind of like a bit a slightly more complicated interface, I think. But it allows you to do a bunch of stuff. Game making takes time. With like, if you want to do a platform game in Construct, you can just create a sprite and say this is a um, this is a platform physics character, and then suddenly you get all the physics and all the kind of jumping movements, all that, and you get all that for free instantly. So if you're on your platform and you can make one in minutes, you can strip where game can take a bit longer, but I think game is a bit easier to use. Um, um, my point is mainly is to try out both if, you, if you're really starting out, because they're both kind of interesting. And I know some people will swear by construct and I know personally I swear by game maker. Um, I don't want to force one or the other on you. The game example I've got here is um, this game called Phenomenon 32 by, oh, I don't know, Spain name, Jonas Kreitz, uh, I don't know. Um, it, it has very low biographics, but it's this huge epic sprawling post-apocalyptic game incredibly hard and really and a huge elaborate story, really, really great game. Um, obviously the screenshot doesn't really do it justice other than men. <laughs> um, 
but Conscript is lovely, um, so check that out as well. Um, oh, actually, I definitely meant to mention this. Um, don't feel like you have to sit and take notes on all this. I'm going to put all this in the forum afterwards. Um, I probably should have said that in case you guys are all doing that. <laughs> I see you are. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I knew I was going to go through this quite quickly, and I meant to mention, yeah, I'll post links and everything, I'll post presentation. I might even put the process video I'm producing because I'm an eco-maniac as well. Um, so, <laughs> Um, next, the, the last one in my beginner set of tools is quite a different, a different tact, is, um, is RemPy, um, which is a game, um, sorry, an engine that was originally created to produce Japanese visual novel style games. I'm, I'm sure you've seen them, the ones with you know, the anime character pops up in the, the text bubble, and then they talk about how they're awkwardly in love with some girl at school or whatever. Um, but, 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 but RemPy is, is actually fantastic and has been used for a lot of ways that, that go beyond that because it's, it is a, um, it's a tool that obviously it looks like code when you're actually working with it, but actually it's all very English language based. It's like the, 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 the syntax is incredibly simple. We did one of these game jam things we did, and a uh, journalist, um, Kieran Gillen, came along. I don't think he'd ever made a game before. And he came along, and like, the, the last hour of the three hour game jam, he made a game in RemPy, having downloaded it and learned how to use it within an hour. And, and this is a journalist, so obviously he doesn't know anything about programs. So. Um, <laughs> So anyway, um, but he, but I, I mean, actually, I'm impressed how quick and easy it is to work with Rempire. If you're, it's best to think if you're a writer, if you like writing stories, Rempire allows you to take those stories and make them interactive. Um, you can put choices, branching. There's lots of stuff you can do, and the, the absolute extreme of what you can do is this game here um, called um, Digital Love Story by Christine Love, where she made this huge, elaborate hacker simulation based around sort of old BBSs. That's a really lovely game. Um, I wouldn't quite go that far because I would like to a lot of work to do. But um, I've played around with this. You can make really simple, fun things, and you don't, you, can't, you don't have to have graphics if you don't want to. You can just use pure text. But if you're really starting out and you're a writer and want to tell interactive stories, uh, Rempire is just so damn simple and it's a lovely tool. Um, okay, so those are the, those are the three beginning tools I've got. Um, and if you really don't know much about coding or technical stuff, those are probably the best three to start off with. Uh, welcome, Lakers. <laughs> Lex just comes into it to work my panel and ruin the flow. <laughs> Tosser is now. Um, okay, so the next few I want to cover are intermediate tools. These are for people who have a bit more technical background knowledge because um, these are all going to require some coding, but these are still a big step up from sitting there with um, Visual C and the DirectX libraries open. This is going to, these, are, these will still save you a hell of a lot of time and work. So, first up is, um, is a pair of tools, um, Flixel and Flashpunk. These, these are both um, libraries you can use um, to basically make Flash games for free. You don't have to buy Adobe Flash for it, you can just use a bunch of downloadable stuff. Um, and these are, I have to put them both together because they're both, they're, both, they're both different, but they both do exactly the same thing in a very similar way. So it's hard to tell which one to get. Um, and the makers of the two aren't even willing to you know, indulge us in a bit of competitiveness because they're both good friends. So uh, that actually doesn't help in telling people which one to try out. But um, essentially, flash games are pretty good. Um, pretty good ones to start. Um, if you know a bit of coding, flash games are great because um, um, these libraries make it pretty damn easy. And then, if you make a flash game, the audience is huge compared to if you make a downloadable game. So you're going into the business of it slightly. Because, but if you like, if, if you make if I make a downloadable game, like you know, you might get a few hundred people play it. But if you, if you put a flash game online, for instantly thousands of people will jump on it, and if it's a good one, that number will go a lot higher. So there's a huge audience if you can if you can take the time to work out to make flash games. And these two libraries, what they do is rather than you sitting there having to write all your own sprite and physical code and music code and all that, they basically do all that for you. Um, you. You have to then just focus on sorting out your game design and sorting out um, and your graphics and shit like that. Um, so essentially, these are just a quick level if you want to make a flash game. They're very basic libraries, but they are they are a lifesaver. Um, next one is my tool of choice, uh, Unity. I love Unity, so I'm a little biased. Um, Unity is the only 3D tool I'm really going to cover. Um, but it's 3D done in an incredibly easy way. Um, Unity used to, I mean, you used to have to pay for this, but now there's a free license if you're making small projects with it. And Unity kind of gives you uh, everything you need to just get, get 3D models up and running in a game environment really quickly and easy. Unity's actually what we're going to be using the demo for afterwards, um, so I'm going to show you this in a bit. Uh, but if, you're going, if, you want to, if you want to make a 3D game while you're starting out, Unity is almost certainly your best bet because there's nothing else anywhere near as easy to work with um, in 3D. And as far as I can tell you, anyway. Well, I mean, maybe there's some really nice 3D stuff, but if you actually want to make a game, your design Unity is wonderful. Um, well, I'm too biased to talk about Unity. <laughs> so I'll talk, I'll, talk, I'll talk about a few more um, things. If you actually want to make a game of specific um, genres, then there are a bunch of uh, domain specific engines you can use. If you want to make a point and click adventure game, there's two um, AGS and Wintermute. Um, AGS uh, Adventure Game Studios is um, the more popular one, and it produced this game here called Bender Down That, which is incredibly funny. 
Um, and I, um, and uh, I have to mention Wintermute, um, which isn't, you know, this is this game called Dirty Split, but I have to mention Wintermute because that's the one I used for my first game, um, White Chamber, um, because Wintermute is a bit more powerful than AGS. I mean, uh, AGS is a big community, very popular, but it makes very low resolutions sort of retro style and adventure games, while Wintermute has much higher resolution has a very powerful set. Lovely, lovely engine. But basically, if you want to make an adventure game, if you use one of these, these do a lot of the kind of adventure game stuff for you. Or, Inventory management and pathfinding and all, all kind of stuff you're going to need to do. Essentially, the engine does that and just says, "Well, you're only making this type of game, so I kind of can help you get a leg up along the way anyway." Um, and I should also mention Inform, which is um, it lets you make um, old text adventures or interactive fiction, as they now pretentiously call themselves. Um, so Inform, uh, like everything here breaks down into two different choices: Inform six and seven, where seven is actually an upgrade of six. Um, in for, um, and big, but anyway, this produced like the old sort of Hitchhiker's Guide style of like, text adventures. Um, and um, in Form 6 is like all programming style, like coding. And in Form 7, they decided to make all natural language. So you type, like, you know, the, the, the bedroom is a room in the house. And, you know, and the, the room is north of, you know, the garden. And you just type, you write it in English, English language, and it turns into a game. And what it actually does is com compiles that back down to Inform 6 code and then makes that a game. Which is, which is why 6 or 7 isn't actually, it's a matter of whether or not you're a coder or whether or not you're just coming out of new, because if you're a coder and you try 7, you actually get very confused. Um, I actually thought include this in intermediate rather than beginner, because they may inform 7 in the hope that you can get new people in, but actually writing in natural language like that ends up being quite confusing, and actually you're essentially learning how to code, um, what's it, um, um, you're essentially learning how to code, but in a, um, in, 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 with language in a weird way, so I, I find that quite tricky, but, sorry, you got a question? Um, these do all work both PC and Mac. Uh, of the tools I've gone through, um, I'll talk about across, I'll just go back right through. Um, right, game Maker and Constructs, sadly you are totally screwed, they are Windows only, <laughs> which is really annoying. Um, Rempire will compile that to Windows, Mac and Linux. Um, uh, Flash is, well, you know, Flash is Flash. <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, you can develop, you can develop on Mac or Windows actually, um, and um, yeah, you can get and obviously that's what some people do with Flash. Um, Unity is cross-platform as well as Mac and Windows, but not Linux. Um, AGS and Winterview, these are both Windows only, I think. Um, and Inform is at least Mac and Windows and maybe Linux. I don't know. Um, so that's actually the last of these um, intermediate tools I'm going to mention, but I should throw out a mention of these. Oh, three, yes, sure. Um, what about the XNA Toolkit for C Sharp? XNA Toolkit, uh, I didn't mention that because to me that basically uh, boils down to form programming at that point. Um, I, I mean, compared, I mean it's, it's, it's higher level than the so, uh, I should forget which way around the levels go, but anyway, it is, but essentially it is as much, it's more work than using something like Flexel. I mean, I work with the XNA Toolkit and essentially if you're a programmer and can work with that already, then that's great. Um, my, my thing is that I think if you're just starting out and making games, the problem with starting something like that is that you spend your time learning how to code and learning how to work with them, you know, direct X libraries and all that kind of stuff. And the problem is, I just think that ends up being a distraction from making a game. Um, and I was going to mention this anyway at some point, but the, the, the biggest pro problem I find programmers have when starting out making games is that they end up making tech demos rather than games. They spend up, there's, a, there's a fascination with playing with technology and producing clean code, and, and what, what you see lots of <laughs> screenshots posted online of lovely lakes with, with hills and saying, this is the 3D engine I've been working on, it's going to be wonderful. But these things never become games. And X and, and X and A for me as a starting tool, I think is not the best way because essentially you will spend all the time working on how to write an engine and not make a game. And, and you know, it's, it, well, I, there is other reasons I can have a problem with X and A um, for business reasons. Um, uh, we have actually one of the most successful X and A developers I know here in the room, uh, Rob, who's produced a game that has uh, featured on their um, on their IGN picks and on their front page was in um, the um, on the um, Independent Charles show on there, which he covers games and reviewed on there. And he's, he's made upwards of the amount I'm making a day on that game so far. <laughs> so uh, for business reasons, I do have a problem with XNA. I'm sorry for picking on you, Rob, by so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the, I mean, so XNA, I don't. I mean, I think I'm mean, I'm going off a tangent, but I think XNA is a people have been drawn to it because people like the idea of developing a game for the Xbox, and I do as well. I think that's a great idea. But the reality is that the money to be made there is so much smaller than you're going to probably make. I think if you put it out on Steam. Um, or if you get, certainly, I mean, if you can get, if you can get a good money from a flash pull or all these things. I mean, in business terms, I just think, I think X and A people are being very blinded by the fact that about seven titles have made a huge amount of money, um, and all, everyone thinks that their one game is going to be one of those titles. And ultimately, if you're not, what is it? It's going to be like Avatar Ninja Zombie Drop or something at this point to be to make that amount of money. So I mean, I, I think X and A is nice, and I really like what Microsoft have done, but I just don't, I don't think it's a good, good avenue to go down to make games. I think it's just a uh, of wasting time. Um, and essentially, I just think, I just think that. People should try and make games and not 
spend their time like posturing about it and, and saying like I like the, I like this part of the code in the tech and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, I'll move on. <laughs> Off my happy thoughts. So mods. Um, this is one to me being glad here. Uh, another tip for you: is, uh, don't make mods. Um, <laughs> um, and this is this is being a bit mean, I guess. But the thing is. There was a time when making mods was, was the best way to get into the games industry. I mean, something like that. Best way. Um, hyperbole again. But ultimately, mods used to be a great way of making things like 3D games, and you didn't have the tech to do it yourself. You could um, you could make a Doom map, and suddenly you had a 3D game, and the chances of you coding a 3D game back then were minimal. Um, and, this, and, and there is a huge temptation about taking the tech for a game you've played and then doing your own thing with them. Again, if you want to make a mod, ignore me, do that, feel free. But the problem I have with mods at this point is that um, they're no longer the leg up they once were. There are um, so many available free and simple tools. The ones I've shown you can make you games just as well. You can make 3D games in Unity if you want to make 3D games. You don't have to use mod tools. Um, and, and let's face it, most mods are different. <laughs> and I think that, that's partly because you're spending your time working around someone else's code. You're, 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 they've built their game to work this way, and you're trying to sort of, you want to deal into it. And, and there's some fun in that as well. Um, and if you can get a game finished, that's great. But just, I do, again, I always hate seeing wasted creative talent, and that's what mods often are. They're just like these huge projects on the net that you read about that sound really interesting, and they never get finished. And I find it really frustrating. Um, but I just think, again, if, if those people had. Um, who is me to judge, but ultimately for the start of making these simple games with simpler tools, we could have seen something from them instead of following years of progress on projects that never get released. So, sorry to offend those of you who are making mods, but you know, feel free to get on me. <laughs> Alright, so, um, now I'm going to talk about resources, um, by this I mean like um, your assets in your game. Um, because I said at the start you don't need a team, and so I'm going to try and give you some ideas of how you can get around the limitations of uh, graphics and music and things like that. I'm already over half hour, so I'm going to speed up a bit. Um, so, 2D graphics kind of isn't the big, there isn't that many shortcuts ultimately, but you don't have to make them complicated. You kind of have to, if you're going to use 2D graphics in the game, you don't have an artist, um, you're going to have to make your own. But these are examples of a bunch of indie games that I feel got around this quite well. Um, I don't know what show this project, but the top left is a game by Cactus called Clean Asia. Um, and he uses, can you anybody see anything there? Probably nothing that essentially uses like vector lines and colours and things like that. It looks really lovely on my screen anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, next across is the, the common common method that indie developers use. This is them. I fell in love with the Majesty of Colours by Gregory Weir, and he's just used really basic pixel art style. Um, and uh, I'm not. I mean, it's, you don't need a little bit of artistic skill to do that. But then the next one over is Terry Callahan's Don't Look Back, where he's used the most basic of, of simple drawings and all he's used is shades of red for the colours. But um, he's um, but the game's lovely. And it's a really popular game. It's really nice. Um, and, and, and basically having these triple crappy graphics doesn't really get in the way. This is um, bottom middle here is Dwarf Fortress, which is hugely popular and just uses an entirely ASCII based text. And the last one on the right there is um, uh, Every Day the Same Dream, which just uses simple geometric shapes. The point is, if you're, just, if you're not very good at graphics, and I'm fucking not, um, then you, uh, you basically just need to um, find something simple, some simple technique you can use to put some graphics on screen. Because again, I, I don't think getting bogged down waiting for an artist to deliver art for you. Is the, is the best way for you to start out on making games because all that's going to be is demotivating because I had a bunch of failed projects where I had to wait on an artist because I just felt like I couldn't do it on my own and so I had to rely on someone else and, and if you've got someone you know who is reliable that's great use them but otherwise I just think find a way to work around it um, so 2D graphics is kind of the hardest one because you, there isn't that many shortcuts but if we go on weirdly 3D graphics there are more shortcuts and more tools I think um, I should have mentioned with 2D graphics that you don't really need I don't need my advice for what you can draw in because Game makers sort of come with little 2D tools within them, and like, you know, everyone does a Photoshop. Um, so, if you're doing 3D graphics for games and you're trying to start out simple, here's a bunch of free and um, simple tools. On the top left here, we've got um, um, Google Sketcher, um, which is originally created for architectural modeling, but I absolutely love it, and I use it a huge amount because it's, um, I'm going to use it in a practical demo afterwards, but it's a, a really, really simple tool that allows you to make um, like models in minutes, basically, without all the complications that normally come with 3D modeling. It doesn't produce amazing works. Um, especially, especially engineered towards making like very straight geometric shapes. But what it does is very, very fast, and you can make game models like in seconds, basically. Um, and then next over we have Sculptress, which is um, a more um, you know play style modeling program, and um, it's um, this is a free package as well, and it produces much more biological sort of looking things, like this weird alien thing. I don't know what that's supposed to be. Um, but if, and if you're more confident as a modeler and looking for a free package, I probably don't have to tell you. But this one here is Blender, um, which is the Sort of best example of a, free, a full feature 3D modeling package, but I mean, again, it needs some, some modeling skill to work with. 
Um, and Blender has always been a bit hampered by having one of the worst interfaces in the universe. Uh, but they've just updated it and actually the new interface is kind of actually usable in a weird way. Um, obviously, I mean, I didn't say this, I'll put it out of footage, but you could always just steal Max on Maya if you want as well. Um, <laughs> Um, but the, if, but the 3D model, 3D graphics, um, and a, a technique I've taken a couple of times, simple 3D games I've made, is that actually there are also online archives, the TurboSquid and 3D Studio .com, where these are where people go and like make models and sell them online. But they also there's a huge range of free stuff. And I was making a sort of simple 3D shooter a while back, and I needed a bunch of like capital chips, and I found a bunch of really nice model ones that are all free, and you can use them in your games, and the, the license was all legal and nice for that, and you can just you can just basically use what people have already made. Um, so, that, so you can get around it. If you want to make a 3D game, um, you can use really simple tools, or you can use complicated tools, or you can just let somebody else do the work for you. Oh, yeah, sure. What's the your opinion of physics engine in Blender? Physics engine in Blender? I haven't really, well, I mean, I haven't really, uh, in Blender itself, I don't know, I haven't really played with it to be honest. I find Blender horrendous. <laughs> a friend of mine it makes a living on Blender, and he swears by it. But I, I, I don't really I don't really have a huge amount. Basically, my real blender is because of the because of how esoteric the interface has always been. I've actually been I've always avoided using the damn thing. Um, but now I've had a look going recently with a new interface, and I think I might have to take once they actually reach final build, I'm going to have a play around with it more. But um, up until now, I've always thought blender would just. <laughs> True. Okay. Uh, sound. You've got a bunch of options for sound here. If you want to record your own sort of. Foley kind of sound and like all, you know, actually all recording audio and voices and stuff. There's Audacity here, which is the free sound editing package you're probably going to need. But up here is SFXR, which produces very sort of game like retro chip tuny style sound effects. And the, usually the, it produces a weird range of amazing stuff. And usually what you just do is sit hitting the random button and it'll and constantly play something different. And eventually you'll, you'll hit something that sounds very like what you want and then sit adjusting the tweaking and knobs and stuff like that. But, um, I tend to not actually use SFXR that much because I tend to prefer more realistic natural sounds, but a lot of developers do use that kind of that kind of rely on that sort of Mario style kind of lip noise kind of thing. But there's also a bunch of websites like um, uh, Sound Bible, I don't know how readable it is, but that's made sense. But that's meant to say free sound as well, which are two online sound archives, um, which allow you to basically go on there and they have licenses. Well but again, like, like most of these are online sites, they're people trying to sell stuff, but if you're making a free um, online game, especially when you sign up to make it something simple. They're, they'll let you use them for free. They're, the licensing details are all on there. Um, you know, don't, don't steal unless you have to do anything and get over it. Um, <laughs> so, so sound's actually not a difficult. Um, one of your big tricky ones actually is going to be music. Um, well, that is a tricky. It's easy, it's easy if, you've got, if, you're, if you're a Mac user because you get GarageBand for free. And GarageBand's wonderful um, because it kind of scales to your level of music ability because if you're like me, you, don't, you can't play a note, then it has this huge archive of like music clips and loops and things you can just drop, drag and drop together and build. Basic game, game background music, and I do that a lot for small projects I'm working on. If you're on Windows, there are like a million free um, music making tools if you've got the time and patience to learn them. I've thrown up Masagi up there, but they look like, um, there are there this endless choice of you know, mod trackers and things like that. And if you've got the time to learn how to make music, there, there are, you find what works for you and use the program for it. But if you're trying to skip over it and just be quick and make a game um, and not spend the time becoming a musician, then the, again, the two sites that are great. In Competech, is one guy called Kevin McLeod who produces an amazing quantity of music and just puts it online and you can download it for free and use it in your games. Um, and and it's, his stuff is used in endless indie games just because he's because just, you know, whatever style they're looking for, there's something there. Indie game music, I think it's more a more recent edition, and it's like like the other ones I've been showing, like 3D sort of stuff, where um, a huge range of people will load their artwork and like, well, their music, and then they're trying to sell it to people who have got who are making commercial games. But if you're making, uh, you know, something for free download, they tend to just let you use it. Um, ultimately, all these things, if you actually want to make a commercial game, then you know, put some money up. But otherwise, just they're, they're quite happy to let you use their stuff if you're making a free game. So that is that is it for my. Talk and what I'm going to try and do now is make a game um, in, in as quick a time as possible. I, I set my goal at half hour. I'm going to try and reduce that down to 20 minutes and I'm going to stop boring you guys. So, um, you might want to talk amongst yourself. <laughs> no, we're not going to I'm going to make a simple game. Um, you might want to talk amongst yourself for a couple of minutes while I just set this up because um, I have no idea what I'm doing, but one minute. <laughs> Right. 
So yes, um, so if you, if, once you've made a game, there is an online community you can share with. I mean, obviously this is, as I say, I'm kind of telling this towards indie game making, and so these, this is the indie game community online. Um, your best bet is a site called TickSource, um, which is a huge central hub for the community. There are, you know, and it's, it's basically built around a massive forum where people spend all their time arguing about games rather than making them. Um, so please don't do that. I mean, this is, I mean, this is another hobby horse of mine. I do find that if you go on to TickSource, what you'll find is that in the design forums, people are arguing about what a game is, or is it our game's art. In the programming forums, you'll find people arguing about what kind of um, indentation or, you know, like um, variable naming conventions is best. Um, and in the art forums, you'll find people arguing about pixel art and what is and isn't, whether 3D is better, all that kind of stuff. And I do find that people find a million and ways to procrastinate and not make games, but talk about making games a lot. Uh, don't be those guys, make games. Um, get making games is great. And, but the reason I mention these sites, um, especially Game Collective, is that these two sites are really good for if you're making a game, post it up there as you're working on it and get feedback from other game designers. Uh, these guys are great. They're not going to try and steal your idea, they're just going to be helpful, see what they're trying to do and talk you through. Don't, I mean, they'll, if you put a game up there, they'll give you a lot of feedback and don't do everything they say because a lot of the time they're wrong, they're just into game, they're not wrong, whatever. They're just into different games than what you're making, but also they can provide you a lot of stuff you're just thinking, I didn't even think of that, but that's brilliant. Um, so TickSource is brilliant because it's massive and it's huge and there's massive people there. Games Collective is newer and much smaller, and, but it's actually on there. It's, it's not full of people whining about games, it's not, um, it's not full of players, it's actually just game design. It's some really talented people. So if you put um, a game up on Game Collective, you're going to get some very thoughtful and, and intelligent feedback. While on TickSource, you're probably going to get a bunch of players saying, why isn't this Street Fighter? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they're both good sites, um, so check those out. Um, Yes, uh, game jams are a thing I'm very into. Um, these are where you basically have a short, limited period of time, and usually a theme, and you've got to make a game in, that, in, in those, those barriers. And the things about these are, is they're really good because essentially they force you to, force you to make something in small scope and a, a project that, you know, it's not going to drag out for months. What, what, what you've got at the end of it is, you know, is, is the finished work. And usually I find you come out and feeling kind of satisfied that you've done something, even if it's not great, because you think, you know, I've worked within these barriers. Question? I used to do an um, IRC recently, this one where, because they're all Americans, I had to do it like bloody midnight or whatever, to suit them. Yeah. We literally would get on IRC, we'd have three hours, someone would give us the theme mm. on the IRC chat, and that would be it, three hours, go, make something. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's great, and I love doing those, and, and they do a varying length. Um, the, um, the ones I've got here are. Um, the uh, one month ones are on TickSource a few times a year they're in a competition and they're, and they're usually quite big and elaborate and a lot of people get involved in those and you've got a month to make a game. Um, the game collective run pageants which are the same thing, they pick really weird themes. Um, like one, uh, they're always, uh, one of them is based around the idea of negative capability which is an idea by John Keats of the idea that people are most crazy when they accept that they can't solve everything. And it's like, they pick really challenging themes that really good think as a designer. Um, the one week ones, one, every month, game, experimental gameplay um, project site, and they post a theme and ask you to make a game in one week. Um, every a few times a year, Ludum Day happens, um, it's happening next week actually, um, where you have 48 hours to make a game. Um, actually, we, uh, we, for Ludum Day, a bunch of us meet in Cambridge, and we will be doing next weekend to make a game over the course of that weekend. If anyone feels like when you're making a game, you're more than welcome, more than welcome to join us at the CB2 Vista in Cambridge to make a game. Um, you have to work on your own, but we're all, it's all kind of supportive and people work with you. Um, Tick Jam happens, um, at, least, uh, at this point, kind of happening like two times a year, but we're going to do this more regularly, which is our, we go together for a weekend and we have lots of three hour jams, and you're all sort of together in a conference room or in a cafe somewhere or something, and we just start facing, again, in three hours you'll be amazed what you can make once, you, but once you're using some simple tools that you can work fast with. And, um, and like, kind of like what you just described, um, a glorious training run for um, a thing called Clip of the Month, where people do gather on IRC, and they, they don't actually get generally unthemed, but um, glorious training is kind of like, for, the, for me, the hardcore of making game jams. So three, it's three hours and two hours, the difference is shocking, because three hours you actually have a bit of time to think, two hours it's basically just go and make something. And the idea of, um, of glorious training works is not to work on something for two hours and then go, well, it was a learning project. Essentially, you've got to make a finished game. Um, they want the idea to make something awesome. I think it's quite interesting sometimes, because you'll get on there for the three hour thing and go, yeah, this will be a fun little call out, and I'll go, it's a competition, you're on your own, go! And you're like, what am I on? <laughs> it's great because anything that basically makes you, that challenges you to do something that is within within strict boundaries that you wouldn't have put there yourself yeah. makes you challenge you as a designer and gets you to make stuff. And I think okay, I, I say this over and over again, but essentially I want people to make games. I think making games is great, and if you've got an interest in it, don't let things get in the way. Uh, and these jams are another way to get things out. There. So, in conclusion, I I don't think it's as hard as you might think it is. I'm presuming you think it's hard. Uh, maybe maybe you didn't think that to start with. 
just uh, you speak for yourself most. Just be realistic. Make something. Make something. Make something simple to start with. You can be ambitious later, and if you've got a huge project in your head, I really recommend don't start with that project. I mean, you can get to make it later, but just just work on something that's manageable at first. Um, use easy tools, not tech demos. I hate I hate how much wasted time and code goes into making impressive engines. And basically, don't when you're making your first big game, don't think you're making an engine you're going to sell on and use for 20 more games. Because actually, what you've learned at the end, you probably realise the code base you've made is crap. Um, and what you thought was reusable has actually locked you down in ways you didn't want. Try and make the game, don't worry about the technology so much. And share what you make with the community. The community can be really cool. Um, I mean, especially if you're nice, I'm not nice, I can think of a lot But if you're nice, the community loves it. Um, and so that's pretty much it. Um, so, if you guys have any questions, I'm welcome to hang around. <laughs>